Have you ever wondered what a UX writer does? I certainly have, so I asked one of the very first people with that job title what she does all day. Tori Podmajerski is currently a UX writer at Google. She's also worked at Microsoft and done a lot of other interesting work. And she just wrote a new book, Strategic Writing for UX. We talked about her early work as a content developer on the Xbox team at Microsoft, about the scope of UX writing, and of course, about her book. Welcome to the Content Strategy Insights Podcast, where accomplished content strategy experts share their wisdom with our friends in the content community. We talk with professionals who work across the span of content strategy, from small businesses to big enterprises, from content design to content marketing, from solo consultancies to huge agencies. Our mission is to democratize content strategy, to make its principles and practices accessible to everyone. And now, here's your host, Larry Swanson. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode number 46 of the Content Strategy Insights podcast. I'm really happy today to have with us Tori Podmajerski. Tori is a UX writer at Google, and she's also the author of the forthcoming book, Strategic Writing for UX. So tell me a little bit about how the book came to be, Tori. The book actually came out of uh, going to the Confab conference in 2018. And it was my first time going to that conference, which I highly recommend. Um, and it was uh, right after I was, I was right between going from my content strategy role at OfferUp to starting a new uh, adventure here at Google. And I was, so this was my vacation, was going to a conference. And I, I went there and we had a Slack channel and talking about product writing. And there were so few out of 700 content people, there was 40 on the Slack channel talking about product writing. And we met up at a couple lunches and the, the concerns and the things that people were talking about kind of blew my mind because I'd been doing it for, for eight years at that point. And the things they were talking about, like the people who had been in it a long time were like two years. And I was going, holy mackerel, why are we still solving these problems? And we don't even have a common way to talk about them as a group. You know, so I left that, uh, the conference was great and I was, I was all energized by the content, but also left with this idea of for this discipline to be a hireable discipline that, so that companies could just write job, uh, job descriptions and do that sort of thing, we needed to start figuring out how to bridge these gaps. And most of us were just one or two at an entire company. So how, how could we start talking about it as a discipline with things in common, even if we disagreed? So with some encouragement from my friends who I, to I was reflecting on the conference and they said, so you're going to write a book. And I was, I was actually having Memorial Day weekend vacation at a friend's house who happens to be a UX director herself. And so, of course, there were post-it notes around. So I framed out the book and I pitched it. Oh, nice. Wow, I didn't realize it was that quick that it's <laughs> unfolded. Well, that's a couple things you just said really interest me that like, I think the term UX writer, it's really only come into common usage the last year or two, like, at least in my experience. But you were doing it nine years ago, 2010, at yeah. Xbox at Microsoft. Uh, what did, did you call yourself a UX writer then? And what was that role called? Was it... So officially, our titles were content developer because all of the writing roles at Microsoft, okay, not all of them, I can't say that, all of the ones in my local sphere at Microsoft uh, were content developers. And there were technical content developers, like people writing uh, developer docs for, uh, for game developers who wanted to write games for the Xbox console. So they needed documentation about how to use the APIs and that stuff. Then in the same, so that was sort of our sister team, and we were the UX writers partnering with UX to write the content in the interface because Xbox really understood early on and much earlier than many companies that getting the hardware and the firmware working was one thing, getting the humans doing the right actions with the, the multiple buttons on the controller was an entirely different problem. 
Interesting. Now, now, now I'm wondering, so that level of specializations existed like the, the more, and those are sort of, I'm guessing that the dev writers are like the, the old, maybe come out of that old school tech writing and, and um, uh, the, uh, the help uh, folks. Mm -hmm. uh, and whereas the UX, the, did the UX folks come out of like more design backgrounds? Like, because that's a little bit of a, a, a unicorn in that world, the, the, the UX person who can write. Mm -hmm. um, how, what was the background of your team, the, the other UX folks? The, uh, the background was everything from, well, it was a lot of tech writing and editing background. It was definitely people who understood words and help writing background. Um, I was hired uh, at a time when they knew they needed another UX writer, but you couldn't put out a job description for that. And putting out a job description for another content developer did not ensure that you had somebody ready to write in the UI for consumer audiences. Because even writing for consumer audiences was a specialty 10 years ago. Interesting. Um, or writing, writing help documents of that kind. Um, because most help documents were written by uh, what you were calling old school tech folks, mm -hmm. which assumed uh, a level of familiarity with technology and a level of comfort with technology. So and was that the scope at the start? Was it like manuals and kind of conventional at that time uh, user help materials and then did you kind of ease your way back up into like oh and boy this error message is kind of weird and this piece of or how did I that think I'm not sure exactly how it happened at Xbox because that was before my time there okay um, I will I will leave it to my brethren in that uh, realm to tell that story on another day um, but what we uh, I was brought in and I was told um, I was told that it would be that I would be good at it, despite not having any experience even doing really the tech writing or the. This isn't, I had a totally different background. I was a high school teacher, so as a high school teacher, my hiring manager said, "You can explain difficult abstract concepts to teenagers," and I said, "Well, yes, I can," and and what's great about Xbox is there's no test at the end, so if we could get kids on Christmas morning, able to set up their, tech, their new technical device without waking up the family and happily playing, great, then we won. And at that time, we had this conceit, really, and it's a pretty common conceit, that if we did our jobs super well in the UI, then we wouldn't need any help content at all. And I think that's a great uh, star to shoot for and it's okay to land on the moon of, you know, it is, uh, the UI is capable of taking 80% of people there. But maybe when a person is, uh, is incapacitated or, um, and here I am thinking of people drinking heavily and then wanting to play Xbox, uh, or, uh, or something goes wrong and they don't feel confident about fixing it for whatever reason, then we should also be providing help content to build their confidence and build their, their store of information to get them to the right answer. Right. So the things really work together. Interesting. And what you just said reminds me, I've heard a thousand UX people say, like, look, if you have to explain it, it's a, you know, it's, it, you haven't done it right in the first place. So, but you were still, but there are still, like you're saying, these ex like accessibility edge cases of like yeah. permanent temporary dis, uh, a disability of some kind or another that where you're like, hey, little, help here yeah um, yeah so what's tell me so how did the scope of your work there did that evolve over time that you were there for a while right yeah I was there for uh, I started at Xbox in 2010 and then left after we shipped Xbox one and left there we were restructuring all of Microsoft and Windows at the time and uh, groups were moving around so I was there and the work definitely shifted because we were shipping a new console for example and we were also shifting the UI, like we wanted to stay current and stay new and stay fresh and increase usability and playability and all of that. Right. And what was, I'm, that year, there's so much that's happened the last 10 years. It really And has. so you're, and I'm, I'm starting to think of this interview like an archeological expedition <laughs> in the history, you know, of UX writing because uh, like, Every, I'm, I, because I remember like the rise of mobile and mm -hmm. more people using like s small screen devices, but that's probably a, um, 
there's probably what was that part of what drove the 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 practice that you were doing and, and how you did things at xbox yeah so xbox is uh unusual because we were designing for a living room screen or like the lean back experience of you know you've got this whole screen and some people came in and said well we've got all this room we could just use it and that is not how people read text so actually having uh designed so when I was when I was first at Xbox, I was designing some of or I was designing content for some of the experience on Xbox.com, as well as the Xbox console experience on the TV. And then we also had experiences on mobile, both for Xbox.com and then what became known as Smart Glass with companion experiences between your games and movies and TV shows and on your phone. So designing text that would work in all of those situations and that would translate well into German and Russian and Malaysian. And it, it's really quite a, a, a toothy challenge. Like it, it really has plenty to sink your no, teeth into. Just what into. you just said, that's a wide swath. Everything from <laughs> localization to, um, to kind of omnichannel. Uh, I, I'm assuming... Did you do a lot of work with like things like structured content, like having uh, back-end systems that supported these various... So having back-end systems that support the various uh, endpoints in the same way and deliver the same content to them was not a good solution for Xbox for most cases. So for some of the help content, that was actually great. So if we knew that they were looking at online website help content that could be either in the companion device or on the website. That was terrific. But you would actually use different grammars if you know they are in place, in context, on the console. Because it's not go to the console and go to this screen. It is we know what screen you're on, so we're just going to tell you the button to push. Got it. So there are, there are nuances like that that go deep into the language that even though we're communicating the same concepts and we need the humans who are looking at these words to do the same things, we need to give them the information according to their context. Right. So, so we had some CMS systems, uh, and I'm sure, I know that other things happened with CMS systems there in development in the years since I've left, so I wouldn't want to talk about what they have now. <laughs> Um, but we did a lot of management of those individual strings and snippets of help content. Right. Um, well, I guess yeah. there's other ways to stitch that experience together, mm -hmm. like voice and tone stuff and style guides and, and just your visual uh, materials. Um, how did that, it was that, the, so that was more the thing that held the experience together across all these different yeah. platforms. Okay. Yeah. yeah, the Xbox voice experience uh, was explained to me when I first started as, uh, and I love this explanation, is we are in the UI, not in the game itself, but in the UI, in the shell of the experience. We are the uh, older brother or older brother of a friend who is sitting on the sofa next to you telling you how to do the thing. Not the jerk who takes the controller and does it themselves. We are the one who tells you how to do the thing you want to do and makes it more possible for you. Got it. So you had a well-developed persona of, 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 yeah, of that's who that who help we person were. was. Yeah, that's yeah. who we were talking to them. So yeah. if that person wouldn't say it that way, then we shouldn't, right? If that kind person who just who is pretty cool, right, probably cooler than you, <laughs> wants to <laughs> not you Larry but <laughs> no 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 I get you yeah. yeah yeah cooler than the person who's playing I was surrounded by kids cooler than me growing <laughs> up so. <laughs> oh me too yeah. uh so we we were able to distill that later on especially for uh in the Xbox One time frame of we should uh the voice should be clean casual and keep them playing every word on the screen should get people back to their game or their movie or their entertainment of whatever kind. And if it wasn't moving them forward in that way, th those words didn't belong there. Interesting. How did you uh, measure the effectiveness of that? How well you were hitting that mark? 
So we had both usability testing in progress, right? So as we iterated, as designs were iterated, just like every other design research team, um, did, did these new designs make it more fun? Did it make it go faster? Did it improve satisfaction in the participants? And oftentimes, uh, when you get right down to it with an experience that isn't quite as delightful as it should be yet, you are trying different variations of the words, uh, especially uh, in experiences like sign in and sign up, because there isn't much there, right? This is, not a, this is not expected to be a delight. This is not expected to be like, oh, I can't wait to go sign up for something. Like, nobody says that. Um, but we can make it uh, lightweight and easy and understandable and build enthusiasm and build anticipation and build confidence so that people know that every step they're getting closer to where they want to be. Right. So now you've got me thinking, I want to, I want to make sure that at some points, so let's do this now. I want to make sure that we cover kind of the scope of UX mm -hmm. writing because right there, that's like, I mean, there's stuff that's happened before that, before you get to the mm -hmm. sign up or log in screen. Um, can you kind of walk me through everything? So you're, you're at everything from, are you involved with the, uh, the, the copy before they get to that page? Like, go sign up here and, and here's how you do it. And then everything from there. We'll just talk a little bit about the, the scope of, of your involvement in a product. Yeah. Yeah. The scope very much closely maps to the scope of UX design. So let me, let me back up and sort of put that in the larger business context. Yeah. Uh, in marketing, right, like if uh, marketing drives awareness of a thing and the enticement of a, toward a thing and, um, you know, gets people sort of into the funnel. And we hear a lot about the marketing funnel and did, did somebody like buy the product? Did they convert? And marketing content in general is all about getting, you know, drawing people toward the funnel and getting them to the end of the funnel. That end of the funnel is really where UX picks up and says like, oh, you're here now. Let me make it easy to engage. Let me make it easy to set up and onboard and use the things, do the things you want to do or be entertained in the way you want to be entertained. And if any problems come up, whether it's your fault or our fault, let's fix those problems and keep you going, keep you engaged. And that's what te the text is for. So as you can imagine, if the text is or, or the voice of that text is very different than the, the marketing content that got somebody in, it's a jarring experience. And you feel like, oh, there's a little bit of bait and switch here. Right. How did you, how did you manage that? Was there pretty close ties with the marketing department and in terms of like voice and tone manuals and, and just, the, and not even just that, but just like how you, yeah. like, were they operating from the same, uh, the same, you know, guy on the couch telling them to buy the thing as well as how to use it? Right? Yeah. The, in, in Xbox, we had really close partnerships with marketing and product and business and UX and engineering, all of it, uh, in, you, well, and legal. And I mean, there's just a huge number of people involved and a huge number of specialties that you need in the room in order to make a great sort of deep experience that way. So... Uh, Partnering, like I've certainly worked on other products and other teams where the engagements were different from that, mm -hmm. but where, uh, but that that alignment is sort of you know, we need that in order to not appear to have different personalities. Got it. Throughout well, the experience, think, something I've been thinking about because the terminology is just emerging mm -hmm. for all this, and UX yeah. writer seems to be. A, pretty common that's kind of settling in it's it, kind yeah. of I mean we were talking before we went on the air that that at Facebook that the person who does exactly what you do is called a content strategist so mm -hmm. there's some differences there but I'm I'm uh, j just curious about like the the um the, just the, like how that stitches together like again back to the marketing and, and back into that the um, the people part of it, I guess, is what mm -hmm. I'm getting at, because that's you, you mentioned a lot of teams right there, engineering and everybody from that. How like, and I assume this is huge teams at Xbox. So yeah. how was it? Were you proactively reaching out to like do, or how how did the human stuff stitch together? Oh, the human stuff stitches together with everything from like literally walking to people's desks and saying, "Hi, I'm your UX writer. I'm new here." And I expect to work with you in these ways um, to 
you know, just being in the rooms and being, you know, having having my design partners or my product owner partners say, um, yeah, don't worry about the words. Tori will work on that later. Or, you know, Tori's here to work on the words. What do you think? That sort of thing. So like with any of these human systems, like pretty much any time you're creating something that isn't just you, just you as the sole creator, which is this amazing mythos we have, but having just finished this book, I can tell you, no, there's an army of people. My name is on the front cover. There is an army of people who made that possible. There is an army of people who makes any of these apps or experiences possible, um, with the exception of like the brand new, very lightweight, tiny little app that does a thing. And, and so that army of people all need to communicate with each other. Um, it is very different than uh, what we were talking about, that old school tech writer model of, here's this thing, it's almost done, write some docs about it. Document these features or document the use cases for the, the people who, who will need to use it. Um, there is very little throwing it over the wall in my world. Because if there is, then I can't do my job. No, I just I just had lunch with a friend the other day who's in that exact situation. You know, old mm -hmm. school plays like boring actuarial software, and they're just throwing <laughs> things over the wall at her, and just hey, write this. You know, do your writing thing. And yeah. um, she's she. You know, we talk about content strategy and like what people like you are doing all the time. And I mm -hmm. think it's um, it's very cool that you're out there doing that. Hey, I want to talk a little bit about the relationship between. And this is another thing in terms of terminology that's come up. I've seen mm -hmm. some people. I've, I've seen the term product content strategist. Mm -hmm. And the, some of the stuff you just said makes me think that like product can encompass that marketing stuff as well as the UX stuff. Is that a role that you've seen? Because I've just seen the job title and I'm not mm -hmm. sure that that's what they meant by it. That's what I was inferring that it was about. But does that make sense? Is there a higher level kind of uh, content person that's looking at both the marketing and the, the UX? I have seen, I've seen, like I wouldn't characterize it necessarily as higher level. Um, and, and here's where it gets really funny. People... Uh, there's a lot of people who have not been involved with creating things with words or using words in order to meet business goals or people's goals. Um, and they are like, well, you know, it's language, it's words, you know, do some grammar at it and, and it will be fine. You know, you're good at grammar, do words. Uh, and those uh, people who have that sort of basic concept of what we do think that many of these things are very interchangeable. And some of those people are hiring managers. And th they will say, hey, we need to hire a word person and we need both this, these marketing flyers and we need error messages. And so that person, uh, and this exists at a lot of companies, that person will be doing both of those kinds of writing for both of those kinds of purposes. Now, the good news is they don't have to consult with the other person very often right? Because they're all the same person. <laughs> Got it. So the style issues are less. So the style, yeah. right. They, yeah. they know the voice. They are doing the voice uh, at both ends. I think a, a slightly more common in my experience, but you know, it's a broad field and broadening all the time, is having people do both UX writing, so the writing in the product and the help content or the technical content, and sometimes even the, the developer documentation. So it's the support to UX side because so after the marketing funnel and then people are engaged in things, there is also a place where the experience might break or they might need more help or they might need advanced features that they aren't comfortable with so they want the help content there. That also needs to be written. So while all of it is content surrounding the product or service, uh, it all needs to be written. It is all very different styles of writing uh, writing, you know, a marketing, a social media article versus error messages or even push notifications versus a how-to piece of how-to content, they all have tremendously different uh, outcomes and, and uses. And skill sets and to execute them and all that. So <laughs> yes. it sounds like you've had pretty good support and understanding of what you're doing. A lot of people, in my experience, don't. And yeah. have have you have you done any like proactive kind of outreach? Because so much of this is just about educating those high, everybody from yeah. hiring managers to to people who hire a copywriter. You know, for example, there's there's a need to 
for I think we would all of us, all 750 of us who were at Confab a couple weeks mm-hmm. ago, would agree that there's a need to get more information into those people's hands. Yes. Well, well, actually, this is a great way to get segue maybe to your book. Was that part mm-hmm. of the intent in writing the book? Or? Absolutely part of the intent in writing the book. So people I had known in my first few years at Microsoft who had moved on to other companies uh, were reaching out to me sometimes and saying, how do I find somebody who does for my new product what you did for this other product we worked on years ago? Like, what do I call that? How do I tell my HR department to hire for that? How do I do those things? And I would, uh, I would say like, okay, let's talk about this. And and I would lay out, well, here's market, here's what marketing does, and here's what UX does, and here's what support does, and here are the different kinds of writing. So like we just talked about. Um, and then speaking, uh, hearing people ask questions at the Confab a year ago about, well, what is product content strategy? What do you do? Like, how, oh, well, I work more on the, the engagement and sales document side, but you're working on this. So are those both product content? Like, having that common language around it was hampering both the practitioners of it and the people trying to hire for it and, and lead and support the people making the software. So I, part of what, uh, what I was doing, well, and I was also teaching at the School of Visual Concepts here in Seattle, oh, right. of, of Fundamentals of UX Writing, and that was something that I was constantly being asked. And Larry Asher, who, who had us start that class, um, he was always asking, like, well, what's the difference between this kind of content and this other kind of content? Like, don't the same copywriting rules apply? Don't the same things apply? And I would say, no, Larry, they're different because reasons. Let me show you. Um, right. and, and then you accumulate enough of these reasons, and all of a sudden you have a book. All, yeah, suddenly, yeah. out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it's not quite. How long did it take you to write the book? It unfolded oh, pretty quickly, it sounds like. It unfolded very quickly. So I first pitched the book and got a rejection, uh, and then pitched to O'Reilly. And, uh, and that, was, that was then at the beginning of September. And then a couple weeks later, I had a... Uh, email from an editor saying here let's work on this proposal and so we worked on the proposal and then by the end of October we had a contract Wow! right so then here we are so my deadlines were uh, first week of December first week of January and the first week of February Holy and macro. I got the book done and I do not recommend writing a book on that timeline and I'm an experienced writer. I've been writing fiction. I've been writing other things. I have a disciplined writing practice. This is too fast and too much. Don't do this. Uh, and uh, and my husband just sort of giggles at me now and says, you know, yes, you won't try this again, will you? <laughs> like, you will set more but reasonable deadlines. the family deadlines. is intact. And... The family is intact. Okay, good. It would not have been done without the support of my husband. Um, also, my house is a mess. <laughs> uh, well, priorities, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what do you, tell me just a quick uh, kind of overview of the book, because I yeah. don't want to go through the whole thing, but uh, what, you kind of getting back to your intent in writing it, and just a little bit about the scope and what people can expect out of it. Yeah, so I start out with why, sort of this idea of why, why is this a kind of writing that matters and what can it do for the business and for the people using the experience? And that's the whole first chapter. And then I get into the voice and tone and how that feeds into meeting these goals. Um, and it, the whole middle of the book is about practical stuff, like build out a voice chart about things you can actually change about the text. This is not so much a style guide of like when to use semicolons, although it could be. This is sort of the edges. This is how you make a decision about is this the right voice? Is this string in the right voice? Then getting into uh, one model for working out when you have nothing on the page, when you, when you know that you need to get a, a person from the beginning of an experience to having some result at the end, how, like, here is a conversational method to get them there because conversation is the root of human interaction. This is how we communicate with each other, even if it's just with you know, meaningful eyebrows across the room. Mm-hmm. We can represent that as a conversation. Uh, then we get into patterns of text. And so this is sort of the meat of the book and possibly the most useful day-to-day section. 
I have no idea. I'm in this weird period of nobody's seen the book yet. You'll find out soon enough. Yeah, I'll find out. <laughs> yeah. um, but in this section, I take 11 sort of basic components that make up user interfaces, like titles and buttons and descriptions and error messages and notifications, things like that. And I use three example, totally invented experiences. Uh, one is a um, bus app, one is a social club app, and one is a uh, social game app. Um, and you'll see those in the book. And so with the three different voices that we established for those in the previous chapter, I show how the same patterns work to get you started. You know, you can just apply this pattern in that voice and write your darn text. Uh, and then I say, oh God, please edit it after that and present a model of editing where it's extremely iterative in the, the mode of UX design, you know, just rewrite it to be more conversational, rewrite it to be more purposeful, rewrite it to be more clear, and then get the best nuggets you have out of that and share those with your team. And I talk about how do you work with your entire team? How do you set up reviews for your team so that, that you are bringing them along with you and they see the various trade-offs of what's going on? Uh, then I talk about measuring the outcomes of this. And I talk about measuring both in a direct way, like what can you measure about engagement? How can you do A-B testing? How would that set up at different phases through the, the experience? Uh, then I talk about uh, user testing and, and user research. And I say in the book, like, oh, God, get a user researcher. Don't make this up. But if you're making it up, you know, here's some very basics. Um, and then also a, a heuristic scorecard that breaks down, here are characteristics of usability and voice, including accessibility and um, uh, a number of other things, uh, that you can just use as a scorecard. Here's a scorecard for your text, and then with whatever that score is, you can say, is that good enough, or should I improve things? Did we uncover things in the process of scoring it that I can just fix right now? Great, fix it right now and move on. Nice. Well, I can't wait to read it. I, yeah. Hey, I have to ask one quick question about mm -hmm. it. Which animal did you get? Because O'Reilly oh. is famous for their cover animals. Oh, it is. I'm so excited about this. It is the gray catbird. And the gray catbird is a small, not memorable looking little gray bird. It's ubiquitous in open woodlands across the U.S. It is, uh, so get this, it's little, not memorable, ubiquitous. It also mimics the sounds of its environment. So it's practically the UX text of the US, the continental US. Now, is there somebody <laughs> O'Reilly that like understands so, the book and the, the, the fauna so, out there? <laughs> so here's yeah. the deal. O'Reilly authors do not pick their animals, but O'Reilly authors can suggest to their editing uh, people and fantastic editing people hey, if it were to be something sort of like this, it would go along with the theme in these lovely ways. Nice. Yeah. Wait, we're coming up on time, mm -hmm. and I always like to give my guests one last chance. Is there anything that we haven't discussed or that hasn't come up that you want to make sure uh, you share today? Hmm. I think that one of the things that, that I see a lot in people who want to be in UX writing, and they're coming, especially people who are coming from a writing background, and these are people who are passionate and capable and, and deeply empathetic with their users. And, and they say, but I, sh you know, I want to make this better. Why aren't they listening to me? And I think that one of the things I'm really looking forward to seeing, and I'm seeing more and more, um, is writers starting to take on this training that UX designers have had in their, like, in their school, like UX designers argue for, advocate for, demonstrate, outline. They, they show, they spend an awful lot of time and energy showing why one solution is better than another. And that is not something that writers have gotten practice with in their backgrounds for the most part. So I am really looking forward to people getting more of that practice and 
getting listened to more often because we do some important work. Nice. Yeah, I love that. That's right because we—that's a common theme in all these. It's like we got to get the word out better, and you're, thank you for helping with that. Thank you. Well, it's been great having you on. Thanks so much, Jordan. Thank you, Larry. Thank you for listening. If you can think of a friend who might enjoy this episode, please share it with them. And please join us again for our next content strategy interview.